Chapter 116 The words whispered in the ear of Xiao Tai proved Sima Zhao's subtlety. Said Sima Zhao, this morning the officers all maintained that you should not be attacked, because they are timid. If I let them lead the army they would surely be defeated. You saw Zhang Hu was set upon his plan, and he is not afraid. Chu must therefore be beaten, and then the Shu people's hearts will be torn. These leaders cannot boast that the officers of a broken state are no fit guardians of its welfare. When Zhang Hu turns against us, the people of Shu cannot support him. Further, our troops being victors, they will wish to return home and will not follow their leader into revolt. Hence there is nothing to be feared. I know this, as you do, but it must remain our secret. Xiao Tai showed his admiration for Sima Zhao. In his camp, just prior to his march, Zhang Hu assembled his officers, among them were Army Inspector Wai Guan Assistant General Hu Lai, Generals Tian Zhu Tianzhan, Yun Xing Ku Jian, Xia Hu Xian Wang Mai, Yun Fu Kai Gu and others, some eighty of them. Firstly, I want a leader of the Van, said Zhang Hu. He must be skilled in making roads and repairing bridges. I will take that post, said a voice, and the speaker was Zhu Yi, son of the tiger leader Zhu Chu. Nobody is fitter cried all present. You shall have the seal, said Zhang Hui. You are lithe and strong, and have the renown of your father to maintain. Beside, all your colleagues recommend you. Your force shall be five thousand of cavalry, and a thousand of footmen. You are to march into Hanjun in three divisions, the center you will lead through the Zai Valley, the other two passing through the Liu and Zulu Valleys. You must level and repair the roads, put the bridges in order, bore tunnels, and break away rocks. Use all diligence, for any delay will entail punishment. Zhu Yi was told to set out immediately, and his chief would follow with one hundred thousand troops. In West Valley Land, as soon as Deng Yai received his orders to attack Shu, he sent Sima Wang to keep the Kangs in check. Next, he summoned Zhu Zhu, Imperial Protector of Yangshu, Wang Kai, Governor of Tanshui Kai and Hong, Governor of Longxi, and Yang Xin, Governor of Jincheng and soon soldiers gathered in the West Valley land like clouds. One night Deng Ai dreamed a dream wherein he was climbing a lofty mountain on the way into Hanzhong. Suddenly a spring of water gushed out at his feet and boiled up with great force so that he was alarmed. He awoke all in a sweat and did not sleep again, but sat awaiting the dawn. At daybreak he summoned his guard Xiao Yun, who was skilled in the Book of Changes, told him the dream, and asked the interpretation. Xiao Yun replied, according to the book Water, on a mountain signifies the diagram giant, whereunder we find that the southwest augurs well, but the northeast is unpropitious. Confucius said of giant that it meant advantage in the southwest, that is success, but the northeast spelt failure, that is, there was no road. In this expedition, general, you will overcome Shu, but you will not have a road to return. Deng Ai listened, growing more and more sad, as the interpretation of his dream was unfolded. Just then came dispatches from Zhang Hui asking him to advance into Hanzhong together. Deng Ai at once sent Zhu Zhu with 15,000 troops to cut off Zhang Wai's retreat. And Wang Kai was to lead 15,000 troops to attack Tashem from the left, Kai and Hong was to march 15,000 troops to attack Tashem from the right. And Yang Zhen with 15,000 troops was to block Zhang Wai Gansong. Deng Ai took command of a force to go to and fro and reinforce whatever body needed help. Meanwhile in the camp of Zhang Hui all the officials came out to see him depart. It was a grand sight, the gay banner shutting out the sun, breastplates and helmets glittering. The soldiers were fit and the horses in good condition. They all felicitated the leader. All save one, for advisor Liu Shi was silent. He smiled grimly. Then Grand Commander Wang Xiang made his way through the crowd and said, Do you think these two Zhang Hui and Deng Ai will overcome Shu? Said Liu Shi sighing, With such brave soldiers and bold leaders and their talents, they will overcome Shu certainly. Only I think neither will ever come back. Why do you say that? But Liu Shi did not reply, he only smiled. And the question was not repeated. The armies of Wai were on the march when Zhang Wai heard of the intended attack. He at once sent up a memorial. Your Majesty need to make defensive arrangements by commanding Zhang Yi, left commander of the Flying Cavalry, to guard the Yangping Pass, and Liao Huo, right commander of the Flying Cavalry, to guard the Yinping Bridge and Yinping. These two places are the most important points upon which depend the security of Hanzhong. Send also to engage the help of war. 
and thy humble servant shall gather soldiers and tack em ready for the march. That year in Shu the rain style had been changed from wonderful sight, the fifth year to joyful prosperity, the first year A.D. 263, when the memorial of John Y. came to the latter ruler, it found him, as usual, amusing himself with his favorite Wan Hao. He read the document, and said to the eunuch, here John Wai says that the Wai armies under Deng Ai and Zhang Hu are on the way against us. What shall we do? There is nothing of the sort. Zhang Wai only wants to get a name for himself, and so he says this. Your majesty need feel no alarm, for we can find out the truth from a certain wise woman I know. She is a real prophetess. May I call her? The latter ruler consented, and a room was fitted up for the seance. They prepared their incense, flowers, paper, candles, sacrificial articles, and so on, and then Huang Hao went with a chariot to beg the wise woman to attend upon the latter ruler. She came, and was seated on the dragon couch. After the latter ruler had kindled the incense and repeated the prayer, the wise woman suddenly let down her hair, dropped her slippers, and capered about barefoot. After several rounds of this, she coiled herself up on a table. Wang Hao then said the spirit has now descended, send everyone away and pray to her. So the attendants were dismissed, and the latter ruler entreated the wise woman. Suddenly she cried out, I am the guardian spirit of the West Riverland. Your majesty rejoices in tranquility. Why do you inquire about other matters? Within a few years the land of Wai shall come under you, wherefore you need not be sorrowful. She then fell to the ground as in a swoon, and it was some time before she revived. The latter ruler was well satisfied with her prophecy and gave her large presents. Further, he thereafter believed all she told him. The immediate result was that John Wise's memorial remained unanswered, and as the latter ruler was wholly given to pleasure, it was easy for Huang Hao to intercept all urgent memorials from the commander. Meanwhile, Zhang Hui was hastening toward Hanzhong. The Van Lida Zhu Yi was anxious to perform some startling exploit, and so he led his force to Nanjing. He said to his officers, If we can take this pass, then we can march directly into Hanzhong. The defense is weak. A dash was made for the fort, each one vying with the rest to be first. But the commander of Nanjing was Lu Zhu, and he had had early information of the coming of his enemies. So on both sides of the bridge he posted soldiers armed with multiple bows and crossbows. As soon as the attacking force appeared, the signal was given by a clapper, and a terrific discharge of arrows and bolts opened. Many troops of Wai fell, and the army of Zhu Yi was defeated. Zhu Yi returned and reported his misfortune. Zhang Hui himself went with a hundred armored horsemen to see the conditions. Again the machine bows let fly clouds of missiles, and Zhang Hui turned to flee. Lu Zhu led out five hundred troops to pursue. As Zhang Hui crossed the bridge at a gallop, the roadway gave, and his horse's hoof went through so that he was nearly thrown. The horse could not free its hoof, and Zhang Hu slipped from his back and fled on foot. As he ran down the slope of the bridge, Lu Zhu came at him with a spear, but one of Zhang Hu's followers, Dun Kai by name, shot an arrow at Lu Zhu and brought him to the earth. Seeing this lucky hit, Zhang Hu turned back and signaled to his force to make an attack. They came on with a dash, the defenders were afraid to shoot as their own troops were mingled with the enemy and soon Zhang Hui crushed the defense and possessed the pass. The defenders scattered. The pass being captured, Dun Kai was well rewarded for the shot that had saved his general's life. He was promoted to assistant general, and received presents of a horse and a suit of armor. Zhu Yi was called to the tent, and Zhang Hui blamed him for the lack of care in his task, saying you were appointed leader of the van to see that the roads were put in repair, and your special duty was to see that the bridges were in good condition. Yet on the bridge just now my horse's hoof was caught, and I nearly fell. Happily Zun Kai was by, or I had been slain. You have been disobedient and must bear the penalty. The delinquent was sentenced to death. The other generals tried to beg him off pleading his father, Izu Chu, who had rendered good services to the state. How can discipline be maintained if the laws are not enforced? Said Zhang Hui. The sentence was carried out, and the unhappy Zui's head was exposed as a warning. This severity put fear into the hearts of the officers. On the side of Xu Wang Han commanded at Yucheng and Zhang Bin was in Hancheng. As the enemy came in great force, they dared not go out to meet them, 
but stood on the defensive with the gates of the city's closed. Zhang Hui issued an order, speed is the soul of war, no halts. Lai Du was ordered to lay siege to Yucheng, and Zhang Kai was to surround Han Cheng. The main army and of Zhang Hu would capture the Yangping Pass. The Shu general Fu Kai and commanded at the pass. He discussed plans with Zhang Shu, his second in command, and Zhang Shu was wholly in favor of defense, saying, the enemy is too strong to think of any other course. I do not agree, replied Fu Kian. They are now fatigued with marching, and we need not fear them. Unless we go out and attack, Yu Cheng and Han Cheng will fall. Zhang Shu made no reply. Soon the enemy arrived, and both officers went up to the wall and looked out. As soon as Zhang Hu saw them, he shouted, We have here a host of one hundred thousand. If you yield, you shall have higher rank than you hold now. But if you persist in holding out, then, when we take the pass, you shall all perish. Jewels and pebbles will share the same destruction. This threat angered Fu Kian. He bade Zhang Shu guard the walls, and he went down to give battle, taking three thousand troops. He attacked, and Zhang Hu retreated. Fu Kian pursued. But soon the army of Wai closed up their ranks and counterattacked. Fu Kian turned to retire. But when he reached his own defenses, he saw they threw the flags of why the banners of Shu had gone. I have yielded, cried Zhang Shu from the ramparts. Fu Kian shouted angrily, ungrateful and treacherous rogue. How can you ever face the world again? But that did no good. Fu Kian turned to go once more into the battle. He was soon surrounded. He fought desperately, but could not win clear. His troops fell one by one, and when they were reduced to one out of ten, he cried alive, I have been a servant of Shu, then I will be one of their spirits. Fu Kian forced his way into the thickest of the fight. Then his steed fell, and as he was grievously wounded, he put an end to his own life. The loyalty Fu Kian showed in stressful days won him a thousand autumn's noble praise. The base Zhang Shu lived on a life disgraced. One would prefer the death that Fu Kian faced. With the Yangping Pass falling into the hands of Zhang Hu were great booty of grain and weapons. He feasted the army, and that night they rested in the city of Yang'an. However, the night was disturbed by sounds as of people shouting, so that Zhang Hu got up and went out thinking there must be an attack. But the sound ceased, and he returned to his couch. However, he and his army could not sleep. Next night the same thing happened, shoutings in the southwest. As soon as day dawned, scouts went out to search, but they came back to say they had gone three miles and found no sign of any Shu soldier. Zhang Hu did not feel satisfied, so he took a hundred cavalrymen and rode in the same direction to explore. Presently they happened upon a hill of sinister aspect overhung by angry clouds, while the summit was wreathed in mist. What hill is that? asked Zhang Hui, pulling up to question the guides. It is known as the Dingjun Mountain, was the reply. It is where Zai Hu met his death. This did not sound cheering at all, and Zhang Hui turned back to camp greatly depressed. Rounding the curve of a hill, he came full into a violent gust of wind, and there suddenly appeared a large body of horse coming down the wind as if to attack. The whole party galloped off panic-stricken, Zhang Hu leading the way. Many generals fell from their steeds. Yet, when they arrived at the pass, not a man was missing, although there were many with bruises and cuts from the falls, and many had lost helmets. Everyone had seen phantom horsemen, who did no harm when they came near, but melted away in the wind. Zhang Hui called the surrendered general Zhang Shu and asked, Is there any temple to any supernatural being on the Dingjun Mountain? No, replied he, there is nothing but the tomb of Zhu Jian. Then this must have been a manifestation of Zhu Jian, said Zhang Hui. I ought to sacrifice to him. So he prepared presents and slew an ox, and offered sacrifice at the tomb, and when the sacrifice had been completed, the wind calmed and the dark clouds dispersed. There followed a cool breeze and a gentle shower, and the sky cleared. Pleased with the evidence of the acceptance of their offerings, the sacrificial party returned to camp. That night Zhang Hu fell asleep in his tent with his head resting on a small table. Suddenly a cool breeze began to blow, and he saw a figure approaching clad in Taoist garb, turban, feather found white robe of Taoist cut bound, with a black kirtle. The countenance of the figure was as refined as jade, the lips a deep red and the eyes clear. The figure moved with the calm serenity of a god. 
Who are you, sir? Asked John Hugh, rising. Out of gratitude for your kindly visit this morning, I would make a communication. Though the hands have declined, and the mandate of the Eternal cannot be disobeyed, yet the people of the West, exposed to the inevitable miseries of war, are to be pitied. After you have passed the frontier, do not say ruthlessly. Then the figure disappeared with a flick of the sleeves of its robe, nor would it stay to answer any questions. Zhang Hu awoke and knew that he had been dreaming, but he felt that the spirit of Zhu Zhang the martial lord had visited him, and he was astonished. He issued an order that the leading division of his army should bear a white flag, with six words plainly written thereon, secure the state, comfort the people, so that all might know that no violence was to be feared. If anyone was sane wantonly, then the offender should pay with his own life. This tender care was greatly appreciated, so that the invaders were welcomed in every step. Zhang Hu soothed the people, and they suffered no injury. Those phantom armies circling in the gleam moved Zhang Hu to sacrifice at Zhu Liang's tomb. For the Lias had Zhu Liang wrought unto the end. Though dead, he would the Han people still defend. Zhang Wai Tatung heard of the invasion, and wrote to his three generals Zhang Yi Liao Huo and Dong Zhu to march against the enemy, while he prepared to repulse them if they came to his station. Soon they came, and he went out to encounter them. Their leader was Wang Kai, governor of Tanshui. When near enough Wang Kai shouted, Our forces are numbered by millions, our generals by thousands. Two hundred thousand are marching against you, and Chengdu has already fallen. In spite of this you do not yield, wherefore it is evident you do not recognize the divine command. Zhang Wai cut short this tirade by galloping out with his spear set. Wang Kai stood three bouts and then fled. Zhang Wai pursued, but seven miles away he met a cohort drawn up across the road. On the banner he read Kai and Hong, governor of Longxi. Dead rat. No match for me, said Zhang Wai, smiling. Despising this antagonist, he led his army straight on, and the enemy fell back. He drove them before him for three more miles, and then came upon Deng Ai. A battle at once began, and the lust of battle held out in the breast of Zhang Wai for a score of bouts, but neither could overbear the other. Then in the Shu rear arose the clang of gongs and other signs of coming foes. Zhang Wai retired the way he had come, and presently one came to report, the governor of Jincheng, Yang Xin, has destroyed the camps at Gansong. This was evil tidings. He bade his generals keep his own standard flying, and hold Deng Ai, while he went to try to recover the camps. On the way he met Yang Xin, but Yang Xin had no stomach for a fight with Zhang Wai and made for the hills. Zhang Wai followed till he came to a precipice down, which the enemy were hurling boulders and logs of wood so that he could not pass. Zhang Wai turned to go back to the battlefield he had just left, but on the way he met the defeated Shu army, for Deng Ai had crushed his generals. Zhang Wai joined them, but was surrounded by the Wai forces. Presently he got clear, with a sudden rush, and hastened to the great camp. Next came the news, Zhang Hui has defeated the Yongping Pass. Zhang Shu has surrendered while Fu Kian has fallen in the field. Han Zhong is now in the possession of Wai. Wang Han of Yu Cheng and Zhang Bin of Hancheng has also opened their gates and yielded to the invaders at the loss of Hanzhong, who Jai has gone to Chengdu for help. This greatly troubled Zhang Wai, so he broke camp and set out for Hanzhong. That night the Shu army reached the frontier river pass. An army under Yang Xin barred his way, and again Zhang Wai was forced to fight. He rode out in a great rage, and as Yang Xin fled, he shot at him thrice, but his arrows missed. Throwing aside his bow, he gripped his spear and set off in pursuit, but his horse tripped and fell, and Zhang Wai lay on the ground. Yang Xin turned to slay his enemy now that he was on foot, but Zhang Wai thrust Yang Xin's horse in the head. Other white troops came up, rescued Yang Xin. Mounting another steed of his follower, Zhang Wai was just setting out again in pursuit when they reported that Deng Ai was coming against his rear. Realizing that he could not cope with this new force, Zhang Wai collected his troops in order to retreat into Hanzhong. However, the scouts reported, Zhu Zhu, imperial protector of Yang Zhu, is holding Yinping Bridge our retreat path. So Zhang Wai halted and made a camp in the mountains. Advance and retreat seemed equally impossible. He cried in anguish, heaven is destroying me. Then said Ning Sui, 
One of his generals, if our enemies are blocking Yinping Bridge, they can only have left a weak force in Yangshu. We can make believe to be going thither, through the Konghan Valley, and so force them to abandon the bridge in order to protect the city. When the bridge is clear, you can make a dash for Sabre Pass and plan for a recapture of Hanzhong. This plan seemed to promise success, so Zhang Wei ordered them to march into the Konghan Valley, making as though they would go to Yangshu. When Zhu Zhu, who was at the Yinping Bridge, heard this, he said in great shock, Yangshu is my own city and headquarters of the expedition. If it would be lost, I would be punished. So Zhu Zhu set off to its relief by the south road. He left only a small force at the bridge. Zhang Wei marched along the north road for ten miles till he guessed that Zhu Zhu had abandoned the bridge when he reversed his course, making the rear guard the van. He dispersed the small force left at the bridgehead and burned their camp. Zhu Zhu, as he marched, saw the flames and he turned back to the bridge, but he arrived too late. The army of Shu had already crossed, and he dared not pursue. Soon after Zhang Wei crossed the bridge he saw another force, but this was led by his own generals Liao Hua and Zhang Yi. They told him the latter ruler firm, in his faith in a wise woman, would not send help to defend the frontiers. We heard Hanzhong was threatened, and thus marched there to its rescue, but then Zhang Hui had taken the Yongping Pass. We also heard you were surrounded here so we came to your help. The two armies amalgamated and marched together. Liao Hua said we are attacked all round, and the grain transportation is blocked. It seems to me wisest to retire on the Sabre Pass and plan other designs. But Zhang Wei was doubtful. Then they heard that Deng Ai and Zhang Hu were approaching in ten divisions. Zhang Wei was disposed to stand, but Liao Hua said, this country of white water is laced with by roads, and is too narrow and difficult to fight in with any hope of success. It would be better to retreat to the Sabre Pass. If we lost that pass, all paths will be closed to us. At last Zhang Wei consented, and the march began. But as they neared the pass, they heard drums rolling and saw flags fluttering, which told them that the pass was held. Hanzhong, that strong defense, is lost, and storm clouds gather round Sabre Pass. What force was at the pass will be told in the next chapter.